Hello and welcome to another edition of Growth Habits, where we uncover the habits and mindsets of world-class achievers, getting an in-depth look at what gives them the competitive edge to perform at the top of their field. Today's special guest is the Olympic legend Carl Lewis. Carl was a dominant sprinter and long jumper during the 80s and 90s, winning nine Olympic golds and one silver, also won eight World Championship gold medals over the course of an illustrious career. Since retiring from track and field in 1997, Carl has devoted himself to a variety of pursuits, ranging from acting to entrepreneurship to politics. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Good seeing you again. Okay, we follow a lot of guidelines here. <laughs> it's been said that you weren't one of the better athletes in your family growing up. Is that true? Um, it is probably the most true thing of my entire life. You know, when, when I was a kid, I was a very late bloomer. Um, just to kind of give you perspective, in 10th grade, my mother and sister, younger sister, were taller than me still. So uh, I was one of those kids that, that start, got into track and field because my mother and father started a track program. But I was kind of one of the kids out there running, just trying to be the best that I could be and, and um, didn't think it was ever going to become anything. What happened? Um, you know, a couple of things. Number one, um, my parents were amazing. They convinced me that even if you're not winning, be the best you can be. So I like was out there. Your siblings were better than you. Yeah, oh, yeah, they were all better. My oldest brother um, was a track athlete, went to college. My second brother, Cleve, he was a professional soccer player back in the NASL. And Carol, my sister, she was an Olympian as well. She did everything. Carol did everything good from day one. You know, she was like that kind of athlete. So when did your boost happen? Well, you know, what really happened is when I started growing. Um, I went from the end of 10th grade, I was 5'5". Five, five and weighed 120 pounds. And so all of a sudden I started to grow. And it was <clears throat> kind of a transformational thing because in 10th grade I was a good kind of local kid. 11th grade I was very good in the state but never won state. And then my last year in high school, um, it exploded. I became fifth in the world. So it just, and then mm. I graduated at six feet. So it was just, when I grew, my performance grew. What role did your parents play in this? Well, my parents were really involved in everything. Um, first of all, they were t public school teachers in the schools that we went to. I went to their schools all the way through. Where was this? In Willingboro, New Jersey. Yeah, so um, I went to, the only three years I was not in one of their schools was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. But that, and then of course, they were the coaches for the clubs we went to, and they were, I thought they did as good a job as any parents could do. They were, they were strict, uh, education was important, hard work, discipline, they didn't baby us. Um, they didn't treat us different from the other kids, and I learned a lot, you know, and now I take pride when people say, oh, you're just like your dad. I take pride in that because he was an amazing guy. You think it's important for parents to be involved in, in children's work life, success life? Yeah, I, I, I think it is, but it's how you're involved. Um, what we're finding now, as everyone knows, you know, parents are now on the sidelines screaming and yelling at kids. Well, that's not involvement. That's actually living it. Um, I, the thing, thing is, I, I tell parents all the time, because I, I have youth programs and I have all kind of things, and I say, sit in the stands and make it about them. You know, if you, if you watch and observe, you'll see things that you wouldn't if you're, if you're down there screaming and yelling at them all the time. When did you know you were really, really good? <laughs> I mean, when do you yeah. know it yourself? Well, when, when I became a senior in high school, that's when I started to come around. And, um, and you trained around a lot of good yeah, athletes. Yeah, I was, you know, our, our, our high school team was good. We were state champions. And, and um, of course, I made the, the Pan American Games team at 17. And I did all these things. But that was that summer after my senior year in high school. That's so when I realized. Really I said, you know, I can do this. And I'll tell you something that's really funny. The first meeting I ever had with my college coach in school, Tom Telez, you know, I told him right that day, Coach, I want to be a millionaire and I never want a real job. What can you do to help me? <laughs> so what college did you go? I went to Houston. Where you're now Yeah, coach. I went, yep, now Houston, yeah. Now, what about, how important in, in that field, track and field, is coaching? I mean, you're fast, yeah. you're fast, you can jump, you jump. What does a coach yeah. show you? Well, I'll tell you, tell you, um, I hear a lot of coaches say, oh, you know, this person's already good, so just, just not get in the way. Well, in our sport, it's dealt in the margins. You know, if you run, let's say, 10 flat in 100 meters, 2% is 10-2. Well, that's the difference between make, getting a medal and not making the final, not making the team. So uh, everyone that's good, talented, is no better than 98%. So the coach is going to take that last 2%, so it's extremely important. I, you wouldn't even know me at all if I didn't meet Coach Tom Telez. 
I believe that. And how about the work ethic? I hear so many scouts, they look at baseball players and like, mm -hmm. yeah, he can do this, he can do that. But what about his work ethic? Tell me about when you were in the height of your career. What was a day like? Well, you know, I was very motivated to be successful because when you say things like, you want, you want to be a millionaire, you better, you better get to work. Um, generally, I got up and uh, our workout was only about two hours a day. Um, and so most of the day was, you know, early going to school, uh, managing the other things that I did, but the intensity of our workout was so strong. So we would, we would go at probably about 90% for two hours every single day. So a lot of rest. Um, my diet was important. You know, I became a vegan diet at one point. And, um, so it's, it's a 24 hour lifestyle. You only spend two hours, but it's 24 hours. But it's take away from friendships and social activities. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it did in high school. Up. Yeah. You, you know, you can still do some of it, but I, 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 I give a really, when I talk to young people, I tell them, look, I used, I missed a lot of parties. I didn't go to the graduation party. I was two hours late to my, my, um, prom and you know she was mad as all get out and and after uh, uh the pr i didn't go on a school class trip none of that stuff but guess what i missed all those parties i didn't go out and hang out at night i didn't do that stuff but now larry i give them all i'm the they come to my parties now <laughs> because are you, I, are you sorry about that ever or not no you know i i, I don't i i don't look like i don't look at life like that you know i lived the life that i lived at the time and and the one thing i wish and I'm glad that I get from my coaching is now that I'm older. I wish I knew more at that age. But when you get older, you know, I'm 56 now. When you get older, you realize you can't have both. You, you have to have youth and energy. You can't have all this knowledge. So you too. don't have regrets. No, no regrets. You know, are you they say that a lot of really good athletes aren't good coaches because they think that you should do it as well as they right. did. Are you a good coach? Um, I think that I am a good coach, and <clears throat> not because of what I'm doing, because I had such a great mentor. So when I went into coaching, um, I went back to Coach Telez and said, let's talk about this. And the great thing that he did with me was that he didn't want to talk to me about coaching. He said, I want you to know everything. I eventually just want to be your eyes, and we're talking back and forth. And when I was at, I had an 18-year career, so by the time we were at the end, I, I knew most of the stuff. It's just that I needed his eyes and his input. And so uh, now... You can't be motivated all the time. Were there times when you were less motivated? And during those times, how did you get out of it? Yeah. Um, there are times when you get burned out. <clears throat> I took some time off. Um, you, you mentioned in the opening acting. I did singing. I did these things. I took, got away from it. You can't stay intense all the time, especially in our sport. Because you can't... If you have an off day in our sport, it's exposed. You know, a basketball player can shoot poorly, they win the game. Well, if we have a bad race, we don't make the final. So, so how do you get it back when you, you get low? <clears throat> you, you know what? A variety of things. Sometimes it's the technical part. Sometimes, like I said, you have to get away from it. Sometimes you have to challenge yourself and say, is this really what I want to still do? So it, was, it wasn't one single thing. After the break, Olympic legend Carl Lewis tells us the secrets to mental toughness. That's next on Growth Habits. We started Growth.com and this interview series because we recognized that people want to become more. You know, that's our tagline. When you go to our website, you see this person standing in front of this great big mountain and you can see they're just poised and they're ready. You know, they're ready to accept that challenge in their life. They're ready to listen to that restlessness or that frustration inside that says, you know what? I want to become better. I want to become a better mom or a better entrepreneur or a better leader. I want to manage my health better. I want to get things done more. That there's something inside that makes them want to become more. And that's what we've learned by studying the growth masters of the past. It's very clear that three things lead to an extraordinary quality of life, an ability to achieve you becoming more. Number one is that commitment to excellence. And so that's why I honor you watching this video series right now is because you wouldn't be here if something inside didn't say, I want to become more. I, I want to be more excellent at what I do and contribute to the world. Number two, to achieve more, to become more, to become great, you have to get mentors. And that's what we're bringing to you every single uh, month with these interview series, but also through our Growth Masters monthly program, where we bring the great voices from the past, the personal and professional development leaders who really set the foundation for all of us, you know, a Zig Ziglar or, or a Napoleon Hill or Dale Carnegie or Earl Nightingale or Brian Tracy, bringing their voices to you too because we all need mentors to go to the next level. And the third thing we've learned from Growth Masters and for all those who've ever been on that journey to becoming more 
is that you need better habits. You need better daily routines and rituals to put you back on track to becoming more disciplined, more focused, more effective at achieving your dreams and becoming an extraordinary person. This is what we do here at the Growth Monthly Master's Program, and this is what we do at growth.com. It's your time to become more. We're back with Carl Lewis. Tom Tellez, your lifelong coach, said that it was your mental approach that set you apart from other athletes. How did you develop that mental approach? Well, um, my thing, I learned early that what I did was not emotional, it was technical. And so I, I have this saying, you perform on Saturday, but you improve in the meet. I mean, you, you improve during the week. So I, I look at it like a test. You know, I, I really made it scientific. If you want to do well on the test, you study. And if you studied and you have the information, then you're prepared. So I, I, I felt like the harder I worked in practice, the more prepared I'd be in a meet and the less variables there'd be around me. And I wasn't emotional. I didn't get there and say, I'd jump up and down. I didn't have to have an unlucky thing or wear jewelry. It was just simple. Go back and do the elements. But simple things like I used, when I was on the runway, I used to count my steps so that I wasn't thinking about other things. Um, <clears throat> we would work into the wind, into the wind, in the rain, out of the rain, all this stuff, so when something changed, it wouldn't be confusing. Let's say you work for, in the Olympics, you work for four years in a race that takes 10 seconds. Right. Wow, how do you deal with that, <laughs> that kind of pressure for a moment? Right, you, <clears throat> well, it's first, a moment. first of all, and, and to even add to that, if you make one mistake, you lost. Right. So. Um, of that 10 seconds, one second. Well, it, it, it's repetition to me. It's, it's, and I guess for you, you've, you've worked at this for, for years and it, it, you flow, it, but it's always different and, you, and the variables yeah. are different, but that basic core is still there. It's kind of right. the same. I, I took it like a business and, and I kept the emotion out of it. Were you always confident? Um, I always showed it. <laughs> um, but but I wasn't. Ali <clears throat> told me. <laughs> he said, I was scared to death. That guy's trying to punch me. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that one thing you do realize, I don't care how prepared you are, you're always going to be nervous. And so it's, do you uh, focus on that part of it or not? Um, I, I, at the first Olympics, at the last Olympics, because you just don't know what the variables are going to be. What's your advice for people who don't have that confidence? My thing is, get out of your head. You know, find something that you can do that distracts you from thinking about what you're doing. Practice is so important. It's, you know, if you want to go up there in basketball and make that free throw, then shoot 100 free throws a day so that it, it's normal, it's natural. What Larry Bird did. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so I, I, I studied Larry Bird and, of course, Magic and all the greats from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and all sports to see what were some of their tricks. How did you deal with, your, with distractions? Um... My, my thing was, I, I tried to block it out, you know, like everyone says that, but, but I always, like, like, when I was in 100 meters, let's say, um, I always thought about something. So when, when they'd say, come to your mark, I'd think, okay, go to the blocks, get in the blocks, do this. So I would think my way through it so my mind couldn't get distracted. On the runway, I would do that. Coach Deloach said that you were at your best when you came back after a defeat. Yeah, I didn't like to lose. <laughs> it was a motivator for me. You know, when... When I, I, I did not, I, one thing I think that really helped me is that I, to me, like I said, I wasn't emotional, even towards my competitors. Um, I, I think it's okay for them to want to win. I never hated my competitors. I just felt like I had the talent and the ability to do better. So when I lost a competition, I would say, what did you do? What was the mistake? Why did you lose? I wouldn't say, I can't stand that guy. I want to be, that, to me, that doesn't win races. So I, I, I kept it in focus there, and that's why I was able to have a lot of my best competitors were my friends. Did you analyze every loss? I analyzed every loss, everything, every other competitor. You know, I, I as a coach this year, you know, my, my team, Houston, won the NCAA championship. Well, the next day, I said, how am I going to motivate these kids? I went and analyzed and studied every single person of every single team. Um, that's, that's seven other teams, four guys, all of them. I knew all their times, what they're doing, so that I could tell my guys exactly what they have to do. So I spent a lot of time studying in preparation. How did you deal with the loss to Ben Johnson? Um, that, that was a rivalry, Yeah, right? yeah that, that was a complicated one because, you know, behind the scenes, we knew that Ben was on drugs at the time. 
and it was like he's getting away with it. But also, it was a year after my father passed away. And the last thing that I said when I saw him was that, Dad, I'm going to win this medal. I'm going to win next year in 88. So when I crossed that line and he was in head, it, it was like... How much God, did he beat you about? about? About a yard. And my mind was like, gosh, um, he's cheating. He won. You knew? Dad, he, how did you know he was well, cheating? Well, we, you know, it's kind of like anyone. You see the changes in people. If you're, you have friends or you have coworkers or something, and you saw, I saw his body get big, he got fast. I was like, who's this guy? You know, and it wasn't just me. We all, we all kind of knew. And um, it was really, it was really difficult because I felt like I let my father down. I felt like they weren't stopping the cheater, and it was just all these things going on in my mind. But what saved me, Larry, was that I had the long jump the next day. So I went to bed and I said, okay, you, either you can let him defeat you the rest of this meet, or you can get it together. And so the multiple events helped me. He got stripped of those, didn't he? Yeah, he did get stripped. And I and I did get that exact and You medal. got to be the winner. Yeah, right? they take the medal back, boy. And they make sure you get it because they come and get yours first. <laughs> you know, they're right. like, give us a silver, you don't get the gold. Could Ben Johnson have been okay without it? Um, he would have been, that's like probably... Barry Bonds would have, was a great player. Yeah, he didn't he, need anything. Yeah, well, Barry is an amazing athlete, yeah. you know, and, and, and I think that Ben, he, he definitely wasn't the athlete that uh, Barry was. Um, what's sad is I don't know. You know, because he started so young, we don't even know how he would have developed. You were far ahead of your time. You ate a plant-based diet, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, right. What, what led you to that? Well, you know, I, um, it's funny, I was working with someone and they kept leaving when we get to practice and I one day asked why are you why are you walking away his name is Jeff Marks and he goes I'm hungry you never eat <laughs> you know so I realized I was basically starving myself to keep my weight down and I realized that was not a healthy diet for me and so I, I went to an event and I was on a TV show and it just so happened a guy that that did um, uh, vegetarian based diets was on the show and two weeks later I was in a studio again and I bumped into Jay Cordes the juice man so I said, well, here it is right here. I mean, I'm looking for searching for something. It's almost like, you know, people are searching for spirituality. But it was like God put it all right there. He said, this is what you're supposed to do. And, are you uh, still a vegan? Yeah, I'm not 100%, but um, at home, that's basically the diet I live. And I, it, it's, it's a healthy diet for me. And, you know, it's, it's evolved into things because I have a garden at my house and, and I love yeah. plant days. Oh, yeah, I, I do all that stuff. So Tom Brady is a vegan. Yeah, yeah. You think that's helped him play till he's 40? Tom is going to play to 45 if he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my goodness gracious. Your best times were after the age 30, mm -hmm. right? Yes. What, well, how do you explain that? Because um, the athlete's best years are 27 to right, 31. Right. Right? Well, well, for me, it was a combination of things. Number one, my diet allowed me to stay healthy. Um, earlier in my career, there was so much pressure to do so many different things, all the multiples all the time. And then as I got older, I had a lot of young guys that were training with me, Leroy Burrell, Mike Marsh, Floyd Hurd. They were five years younger than me, and those guys won at my titles. So I practiced with these guys every day and basically used and just kind of sucked the energy out of them to stay at it. Um, when, you, when you're challenged, when you're at the, at the twilight of your career, and every single day and every single practice um, in a sport like ours, you're exposed, you know Monday through Friday if you're going to win Saturday. And so I was motivated. Let's talk about that. How did you approach practice? As Allen Iverson once said mockingly, practice, it's just practice. <laughs> I know Alan, and funny. I was like, I, I cringed. But that was pretty funny. Yeah, it, it is funny. Um, but in our sport, just to put in perspective, when you're sprinting at our speed, your feet touch the ground five times a second. And so everything's muscle memory. Well, it's just, it's every, it's 100% muscle memory. So you have to do it over and over until you don't think about it. When I long jumped, you saw all those movements, 1.1 seconds in the air. So all of that happens. And, and, and my coach had to say, move your arms six inches that way in the process of this in the air. So practice is, it's impossible without You said goals for yourself during yeah, practice? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and, and I used, believe it or not, I used goals in practice to do meets. Like for instance, when I would long jump, I would do it from a short pr approach. Normally in a meet, my approach would be 21 steps. Well, I would do an eight-step approach in practice, pop up before a long jump competition. So <clears throat> my best is 29 feet, but I knew if I jumped 26.5 or better, then I was in world record pace. So I would use practices. 
uh, my Monday practice would be a breakdown run. If it was a great breakdown, I knew I was going to run well Saturday. So every day was important. How important is technique? Uh, technique in running is paramount. You know, I mean, the, the hardest thing about sprinting is that you have to be powerful and fast, but then relaxed. Um, so you have, to, you have to be on the edge of relaxation and power. And then also your weight and everything has to be down. We're, 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 it's, it's, when I explain to people, you can lift and be strong all day long, but it's just like getting a big, strong guy on the back of a horse. You know, they want little people. You ever lose your technique and then regain it? Every year. Really? Every year you lose a percentage of it because you, when you get off season, you're sitting down for, you take a month off, three weeks off, and then all of a sudden something's 5% off. So that's why I needed Coach Telez's eyes to get me back. Speaking of coming back, between the 92 and 96 Olympics, you had a few down years, yet you predicted a big year in 96 and you won the gold. How did you know you would do that? Larry, I was going to be 35, <clears throat> And even if I didn't do it, I could have blamed it on my age. <laughs> it was just, it was the motivation, you know, and it wasn't, I didn't know that I could do it. You know, I felt that my technique could have me competitive, but um, if I didn't, I was just, oh, I was just, he was just too old anyway. So I, I, it was kind of one of those things that throw, throw your hat in the ring and it doesn't, you, you could win either way. What's the biggest lesson you learned as an Olympic competitor? Um, simplicity. 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 Um, when I went to the Olympics, 84 here in Los Angeles, um, I cut everything out and focused on just being the best I could be. And as my life became more complicated and older, which we all do, it was more difficult. But when I got to the Olympics, we always simplified it. And so it was the most simple time of my life because we kind of cut out the distractions. We, we got into a home with friends and we did these things. So it really taught me, if you want to be successful, you have to find a way to bring simplicity into to successful things. You Other want. than hard work, what's the one habit you developed you think contributed most to your success? Um, understanding if you want to be successful, you have to be focused and sacrifice. Um, and that's a habit? And it, That's it, a habit now that I have now. I, 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 and I like it. You know, I, I like the focus and the, the 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 general energy that I have, and also realize that you have to you have to drive yourself. Um, you know, I'm in a sport that was never really professional. It's always here and there, and it's it's allowed me to get to this age and be successful. But also, you know, I'm older, and there's one day when people can say, "Well, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I don't want to see you anymore." So all of these kind of things, these 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 habits that I learned as an athlete, knowing that I was going to get old as an athlete, but you're also going to get old as a person. You're also going to have all these challenges, so there's, be aware of them. There's no money in track and field. Is Not as much as there should be. Yeah. And and me as a coach at the University of Houston, these kids say, I want to be pro. I want to go to the Olympics one day. And so part of my job is to convince them that we can do it and help them get there. How did you know when it was time to hang it up? I... Um, was 35 just before the Olympic Games and I was standing in lane one of the 200 meters at the Olympic trials and we just had this discussion about lane assignments and all this kind of stuff and I realized this the same conversation I had 10 years ago and I just didn't really want to have that conversation anymore and then I was I was remodeling a home at home and then I was Practice was as important. Here, I'll, I'll be there in 10 minutes. The flowers are being delivered, you know. And I realized that once it wasn't number one in my life, then I didn't need to, to do that it. Was that your last race? Yeah. Uh, that was my last big race. I ran one more year after that. But that year was just kind of like a, uh, you know, goodbye year and, you know, make sure that the check's payable to cash, like Fred used to say. Did you miss it? <laughs> um, I miss the camaraderie. But I, I guess the best way to describe my experience was like um, high school. I loved it, but don't want to go back. In our final moments, the great Carl Lewis on expanding his post-Olympic career. You're watching Growth Habits, and we'll be right back. So no doubt, when you watch interviews like this, you get inspired. You know, you see some level of greatness, and you start asking yourself, am I giving my best right now? You know, am I giving my best to my family? Am I giving my best to my business? Am I showing up and showing the world who I really am? Am I exerting my personal power and strength in the world? That's the power of watching interviews like this. And I just say, let's take it to another level. You know, if you haven't heard about the Growth Masters monthly program, 
this is what it is times 10. And let me tell you what I mean, is we've gathered the greatest personal and professional development courses in history, and we put them into a members program for you to access right now. When you sign up for the Growth Masters program, as an example, you get 50, that's 50 courses right now from some of the greatest personal and professional development teachers in history. This is Zig Ziglar teaching you how to rise to the top. It's Brian Tracy teaching you how to be a better entrepreneur. It's people teaching you how to master your mind, master your health, master your finances, master team, master leadership. It's the mentors and the voices who have shaped my life and so many other great leaders in our industry. It's your opportunity to get 50 courses unlocked right now for just $49 a month. And these are courses that most people have paid $300, $400, $500 for. We also give you every single thing we can from our vault at growth.com to help you succeed. From getting you on a phone with a certified high performance coach so you can identify where you're at and where you need to go. You know, it's, sometimes you just have to talk it through with a small group of people. So we put you on a small group coaching call with a certified high performance coach so you can figure out like what should you focus on right now. We give you two tickets to our Growth Summit. That's our live seminar where we bring some of the great leaders of today in to inspire you and instruct you on how to go to that next level. We do things like making sure that when you're in our members area, you can participate with a community of people who are positive and amazing and want to help you go to another level. And every single month we release new training. Five new courses released to you every single month in personal and professional development. Again, to help you with your health, or your finances, your leadership, your mind, your body. Really looking at your entire life and making you better, pulling in some of the great voices in personal and professional development. But also, it's me with you live every single month where I teach you the latest in motivation, high performance, and psychology, and teach you what I've learned. What did I learn from Napoleon Hill, or Earl Nightingale, or Dale Carnegie, or Tony Robbins, or or Stephen Covey. What I learned from them, I share with you every single month. And there's Larry, every single month interviewing another great to help you be more inspired just like you have been in this interview. It's all part of the Growth Masters monthly program. You can see a link on this page where you can get signed up today for just $49 a month. And remember, these are programs that people paid hundreds of dollars for each. You get 50 unlocked for you right now. Look, lots of people spend lots of money on Netflix or gyms each month, and that's cool. They're paying, you know, to entertain themselves or to get their body fit. But it's time to get your mind fit, to get your mind, your body, your whole life back in alignment so that you can become more, so you can serve better, lead better, achieve more. That's what the Growth Masters program is all about. This is a great edition of uh, Growth Habits. What's your biggest goals in life um, right now? Right now, my biggest goals are I, I wish I was worth $100 billion mm -hmm. because there are a lot of things I want to, I want to spend money on. Um, I wish I could give more money to my university. I wish I could give more money to the sport. Um, I wish I could. Uh, there are a lot of things I, that are left to do. And I guess my biggest goal is to keep working until I can do the things that I want to do. Do the lessons you learned as an athlete transfer to post-athletic life? Oh, absolutely. Um, the hard work, discipline, you're not going to win everything, get back up. Do you use what other coaches taught you in your coaching? Yes, I do. I, I think that the thing about it, I even use the athletes. Um, they're teaching me things about being a better coach. So like I, teachers say students help them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I listen larger than my ears. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I got, that's the best way to say it. <laughs> that's well said. Do you want to coach for the Olympic team? Um, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to be an Olympic coach. Um, I want to coach Olympians. Um, I think that, that that's that's it's it's almost like um, if you're a professional team coach, does it does it, it wouldn't it be great to coach young people that are in the, the Pro Bowl or in the Super Bowl, then have to go. And and I know there are other people that they value that. I, I my biggest goal as a coach, and I tell this to the parents, is to sit in the stands and see the parents' eyes. And, and see if I get the same emotion that I got when I saw mine. Uh, Los Angeles just agreed to host the games in 2028. You mentioned 84. Will you get involved in any way with that? I, I, I have been working with LA 2028 
all the way through. I will do everything that I can. Um, the biggest thrill for me would be to be back in that stadium again, watching kids that I'm coaching running, um, taking my granddaughter and my son there so they could see the Coliseum. So I, I'm anything I can do for 2028. I'm excited. You think Paris will be good too? Oh, Paris is going to be a great game. I, I, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's Paris. It's 100 years. Um, mm. It's a wonderful city, and I think everyone wins. And this is in, in a time when the Olympic challenge was difficult, everyone won in this. What do you make of the track and field presence of the, Uni presence of the United States today? Well, it's a challenge like stand? our sport. Yeah, we, we stand, we're doing really well in the world championships right now, which are going on um, this month in August. And I think what I'm excited about it, it's, it's kind of that time when we're changing. A lot of the older athletes are starting to move and the young athletes are coming in, and they're very successful. So I think the success rate of it is bright. We just have to build a sport where athletes can be successful financially. Usain Bolt just retired. What's his legacy? Um, you know, part of it is one of the greatest sprinters of all time. And what I believe is that your real legacy is what you do after. Um, because we, we know a lot of great athletes. Um, but I think, like Ali, when Ali passed away, it, it changed me. It changed my heart. Um, it made so me well. mo it made me more socially conscious. It made me feel like all of us have to fill that void. And I think that's really what's ultimately going to be his legacy. At this point, what are the most habits for success for you? Just understanding <clears throat> that failure is a part of success. Um, don't be afraid to try something. Don't worry about what people say about you. <laughs> um, and work hard. I mean, that's it. Do you have a morning routine every day? Yeah, I do. I do. I get up every day. I wake up at about between 6.30 and 7. And I, don't, I wake up really about 4 or 5. And I'm in the bed, and that's when my mind is clearest. So that's when I start tweeting. Um, not tweeting, but that's when I start emailing or texting my athletes. Um, I get creative. If there's something going on around the house or something, that's when my creativity comes between, like, 5 and 7. And then I have breakfast every single morning at 9 sharp, every morning at home. Um, and then I go to the school at about 11. I come home for lunch every day. I live a mile away. And I go back for afternoon practice and have dinner at 4.30. That's, that's my day. Dinner at 4.30? That's for 98-year-old people. <laughs> well, sometimes I feel it. <laughs> I read, look, look, five... Uh, you five know, you get there early, you can keep the rolls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what advice do you have for people pursuing dreams? What do you say to people? Um, start with the ultimate and work your way back. So I, when I was 17, I wanted to jump 29 feet. So when I broke my first world record at 19, it was like, I'm on my way. It wasn't about, look at me. And leave your spotlight in the bag. Because a lot of times when they have success, they bring the spotlight out. Leave your spotlight in the bag. You said that parents should push their children rather than make it easy on them. Absolutely. I think one of the issues that we have, especially... But you don't want to push them too much. No. Like Jimmy Pearsall's father, who... Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, in life, um, tell, tell them, you know, I, I have um, a, a website called The Perfect Method. And part of that is that l raise your kids to say it's okay to try to be perfect, you know. And, and, and when I say push, I mean, get, let them try experience things. And if they lose or they're bad, okay, it's okay. All right, you lost today. Well, let's find a way to get better. I think right now we want to hover over them and like, oh, little Johnny's feelings. Little Johnny's feelings will be just fine. I mean, we used to grow up and we, we dealt with everything. We ate lead in the window and all that. We all f figured it out. And now kids, it's like they can't do anything. They're How important is community service to you? Um, community service is all that I grew up with. My parents were teachers. They had clubs. They did things. And I'm from New Jersey. And I didn't go to the Jersey Shore until I was in my 20s. I didn't even really know what it was because we were on the road doing the track meets and doing these things. But it was the best times of my life because I, I, my, my parents are also my role models. And then I got older, and before I realized it, I became them. And now looking back, it's like I, I admire them even more. What are you most proud of? I'm, I'm proud that I've, ma I've made it through, that I, that I think I've left a legacy in our sport. Um, you know, I fought for issues. Um, I, I have mentors and, and role models like Kurt Flood, who changed baseball, and, and Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali, who stood up for things that were important to them. You know, my, my mother was Rosa was a friend with Rosa Parks, and we were in, involved in the civil rights movement when I was in Birmingham. And so those are the types of people that were talked about in our home. What is it like for the athlete? I love and admire athletes because 
their careers are made, are done when most other careers are beginning. Right. Most people start to get successful in their late 30s. Mm -hmm. What is it like, this is my final question, when the cheering stops? You, you can't, you, you have to find a purpose and why you're actually doing it. And I think that um, when, when the cheering stopped for me, uh, I took a break. You know, I went two years. I did crazy stuff. I, I you know, I put, I grew my hair out and had dreadlocks. I got, uh, put an earring in my ear. I got a tattoo, mm -hmm. and I, I live. But then I got back to work, um, and I didn't focus on that part of it. You know, when I used to leave track meets, um, big Olympics, I would leave my uniforms in the room, and I take my medals and I put them in a safe deposit box, because I didn't want it to be about the performance that day. I wanted my career to be about every other day. And so even and so that's why now my medals are at the Smithsonian because it wasn't about them it was about the performance. You're a great man. <laughs> great, thank you. That does it for this edition of Growth Habits. Thanks to our guest, Olympic champion Carl Lewis. As always, we hope his habits for success can make a difference in your lives. I'm Larry King. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, it's Brendan Burchard, one of the co-founders of Growth.com, and I'm so excited to have you here today because. I know there's some part of you that's ready to make a decision for your next level of personal development and self-mastery, but sometimes you're not sure like what to do. You, you know what I mean? Like you've been browsing podcasts or you've been browsing, you know, books or you start one chapter, you don't finish the book or, or you're somebody who you just know that you've been learning a lot maybe on the job, but you've never really had a structured curriculum built for you to help you on your path to self-mastery. It's been kind of like you've been learning a lot by randomness. Well, me and my friends at Growth.com have just spent the last three years piecing together the world's greatest curriculum in personal development. We've cobbled up the best personal development programs of all time in audio, and we put them in a members area for you. We've grabbed a couple online courses. We've got some celebrities that we're going to talk you through. And I'd like to tell you through this entire program. It's called the Growth Masters Unlimited. It's a monthly program where we basically architect your entire curriculum to help you reach your full potential. Because everyone's telling you, hey, go be your best. But the question is, how? I mean, yes, you show up with intention. Yes, you have to-do lists. Yes, you try to make a difference. Yes, you're trying to be kind. But how are you really going to advance your life? How are you really going to become a better human being so that you can serve better, so you can lead better, you can make more? Well, that's going to take curriculum. We can't leave your personal growth to randomness. We need to architect your next level, then your next level, then your next level. So what we've done is build this Growth Masters Unlimited program for you. And I just want to walk you through everything in the program so you can make the right decision for yourself today. So here's what it's about. Every single month, we're going to release a series of new online uh, courses that you can access anywhere, audio programs or video, that you can take that are from the masters, the best people in personal development, literally, of all time. And we'll talk about who those people are so you can get a, a flavor of what we're talking about. But basically, we've gone out and we curated the best of personal development audio programs in the world, and we've already got them in the members area waiting for you right now. 50 of the best personal development programs of all time. This is the stuff from like the Zig Ziglar's and the Brian Tracy's, the Jim Rohn's and the Les Brown's of the world. This is the audio programs that help me develop self-esteem, self-confidence, better productivity skills, better influence skills. We have 50 curated courses that you can access anytime from any device and listen to right now in the Growth Masters Unlimited program that you can sign up for today. Listen to this for 49 bucks a month, 49 bucks a month. These 50 curated programs, most of them I bought years ago, most of them on average from $197 to $297, and you get all access to all of them for $49. There's more information down below, but look, to help you decide to go to that next level of self-mastery, I want to throw in a few things from myself and from Larry King. The first thing is from Larry. And that is every single month, he's interviewing people to get additional insights on their habits. So if you want access to those recordings and to every new one that Larry does, then sign up for the program because that's free with the $49 a month Growth Masters Unlimited. You also get, 
I've thrown in a $500 online course called Secrets of the Top 2%. This was my sort of qualitative study of the top 2%, the most successful people in the world, and what they were doing to manage their teams, to build wealth, to deal with stress, to set up their mind so that they succeed at another level. And it's me and you, in front of, uh, basically in front of a flip chart, teaching you the secrets of the top 2% and what I've observed them doing. This is from working with literally at the billion level, uh, sort of strategic advice level where I'm working with billionaires or I'm working with some of the people who are truly the most extraordinary people in the world. What do they do differently when they think about team or wealth than most people do? You'll learn that in my program. We also give you two tickets to our upcoming growth summit. So if you're like me and you're a live learner and you're somebody who says, yeah, I, I like to listen to these things. I like to take notes. I like to watch the online videos, but you also want to get around people who are dedicated to their personal development from around the world. We have our growth summit coming up. You'll see details down below when you click the button and you'll get tickets to that event as well. That's where it's like, uh, myself, a, a Harvey McKay, a Dean Graziosi, an Ethan Willis, a Les Brown, or, or, or uh, you know, the legends in our industry, including Larry King, will come and speak and train you on further personal development. And then finally, you get a small group coaching session. Because maybe you're one of those people who goes, you know, I just need to talk to somebody. You need to talk to somebody about what is your next level. Maybe you're lacking clarity about what that is or how to get there. So we're gonna put you on a small group coaching call with a certified high performance coach. These are the most advanced coaches in the entire world. They're the people who literally are like the Navy SEALs of life coaching and business coaching. And so if you just like, I need to talk to somebody to identify what's right for me because you feel stuck, you need to talk that out. So we'll put you on a small group coaching session. That's usually $197. That's in there for free. So you roll this up, you can do the math easily. I'm giving you a $500 online course today when you sign up for a $49 a month program. We're giving you 50 of the all-time personal development programs that literally changed my life. These are you know, the best of the best of Jim Rohn's and Zig Ziglar's and Earl Nightingale's of the world. You'll get Larry King interviewing a new celebrity every single month. You'll get those tickets to live event and coaching. Our goal in Growth Masters was to surround you, whether you like live event or online courses or audio training programs, or you need to talk to somebody. We surrounded that, and it's all available for $49 a month. And check this out. You can cancel anytime. No harm, no foul. So I just say, get in there. You can access immediately my entire $500 course called Secrets of the Top 2%. Learn how they think, how they manage team, time, how they think about wealth. You can get that $500 program right now. And so I just say, sign up. It's 49 bucks a month. You sign up for $49 a month, you can watch my entire $500 program, and then cancel next month. I don't care. I know the power when you dedicate yourself to self-mastery, and I know a lot of people don't know how to structure curriculum. You know, you're, you're browsing podcasts, or browsing YouTube, or, or reading this book, or starting that book, but you're not advancing at the level that you could because no one put the curriculum together. So me and my friends over at growth.com have spent years putting this curriculum together for you, and we know it will advance your full potential. So check it out, sign up now for 49 bucks a month. If you don't like it, cancel anytime, but get in there, learn from me, learn from Larry, learn from the greats, and start the next level of your personal development. Click the button down below for full details and to sign up right now.